our final, final presenter, uh, Julie Brown, will be, will be joining us next. She is Program Director of Justice Resource Institute, Integrated Clinical Services. She is a behavioral tech trainer, which means that she does training for in uh, DBT for the group that uh, was developed by Marsha Linehan, so she still works in that capacity with Marsha Linehan. She is the author of the Skills System, which is a modified DBT uh, emotion regulation skills curriculum designed for children, adolescents, adults who have learning challenges. You'll be hearing a lot about that skills system. She provides consultation on that system in the US, Canada, and Europe. Uh, she is the recipient of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities uh, Leadership Award. Um, I would like to um, uh, highlight that I think one theme of this conference is not getting too attached to our labels, our methods, and I think that what we're going to hear about in, in Julie Brown's work is very exciting because um, she saw a population where if we hung too closely to what works, uh, we, we, we wouldn't reach it. Uh, there was need for flexibility and change, and, and, and we got to, I think we'll see some real creativity of how to uh, reach people who otherwise uh, would not be served. Um, we have to take them where they are, and I think that, that what she put together really speaks to that. So I'm very excited to have her, um, and in terms of dealing with individuals helping individuals with intellectual challenges, uh, this is really a perfect end to our day because it really speaks to uh, what are some things you can do um, when the issue is that there are um, intellectual, attentional, thinking difficulties. We're gonna see uh, in operation what this can look like. So thank you very much for joining us, Julie Brown. Can you guys hear me okay? Well, I'm really honored and really excited and really cognitively dysregulated. So I'm just, I'm, I'm being it for you. So I'll just, I'll just try to get myself together. Like uh, Seth said, we're gonna talk about some treatment options uh, for folks with intellectual disabilities at, that ex folks that experience uh, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral regulation problems also. Um, and I feel like I'm, I'm representing the treatment options, but it's like batting ninth in this all-star lineup. So thanks for hanging in here. What an incredible day. I'm just an emotional, fantastic day. Um, I was thinking it's really interesting that I'm here representing the intellectual disabilities world related to treatment because if you think about it, I'm a master's level social worker. I'm presenting to you an emerging practice that's got pilot data. And to be honest, it's about as good as it gets in the disabilities world at this point. So I'm just so excited that you guys are all here and just it's like a great big family bringing everybody on board, sort of thinking about this population uh, through sort of mainstream means. I just really appreciate that you're all here. I've already made one disclosure. I'm a social worker. I'm out about it now. I actually just went back to get my PhD, and so I'm almost like a born-again social worker. <laughs> I talk about marginalization and all that stuff, and I actually believe it now. Code of ethics are my, my real code. But the other real disclosure is about the fact that we are going to talk about the skill system. It really is a treatment tool. It is not an evidence-based practice at this time. It's a set of strategies that's really in its infancy, really was developed through practice with my clients collaboratively. So I just, you know, I'm hoping that it improves self-regulation. I mean, that's really why I tortured myself at almost age 50 to go back to school so that I can actually get data and learn how to actually use it. So let's, um, now I've got to coordinate all this, so let's just, okay, I did it. That's true. Pointer, you could use this okay. forward, backward, and a laser. Oh, goodness. Okay, more cognitive dysregulation. Okay, so I figured um, I talked to Seth about it, and originally I was just going to talk about the skill system, but he and I chatted a bit and decided it might be interesting for you folks to 
if, that folks might be interested in learning a little bit about improving accessibility of DBT for folks with intellectual challenges. So I thought we'd start there and then move into learning how to be skills masters ourselves. So hopefully you'll actually walk away with a few uh, treatment ideas. But I think before we get started, I've got this down, that's for sure. I'll tell you a little bit about my program. I've worked for about 20 years now in Rhode Island and I've got um, treating individuals with intellectual disabilities and very serious sort of acutely dysregulated behavioral challenges. Um, it is part of Justice Resource Institute. It's a very small program and what we do is we provide individual DBT therapy but we combine it with the skills system for the skills training component. I'll talk a little bit about how we got there in a couple of minutes. But people with intellectual disabilities, as well as all the folks that we've already been talking about today, are, ha are at increased vulnerability. People with intellectual disabilities have much higher rates of victimization, over three times as much. They're also at higher risk for mental health issues, as well as experiencing what they call in the field as challenging behaviors. Um, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, so the rates are very uh, diverse on this, from 10% up to 85% are some uh, numbers around how many people exhibit challenging behaviors. Unfortunately, there's not much treatment that's empirically validated out there for this particular population of folks that are really duly diagnosed with mental health and intellectual disabilities. ABA is a tool that is used in some populations of disabilities, but it's not generally used as much with adults living in community-based settings that are in the mild intellectual disabilities range due to feasibility issues and consistency. Additionally, there's some research about CBT that looks pretty good. Unfortunately, the methodologies are not fantastic as well as the measures people are using are more staff reports and, and these like looking at hypothetical, situ people sort of rating hypothetical situations. There's very little with actual behavioral data that looks at generalization of skills, which is really the main concern with this population, which is how do we get them to generalize into the context of their lives. Psychopharm, unfortunately, there aren't many silver bullets out there for this group as well things like diagnostic overshadowing, um, so there's a lot of side effects, the communication problems with the clients. Um, unfortunately, um, there's not really great data either way on that as well. Now, although there's not a lot of, actually there were, I just was looking up uh, neurofeedback. I thought that was so cool. There are a few, two small studies for that. I don't know much about them, but they could, that'd be worth looking at for sure. Um, but there really isn't much data around uh, adapting DBT for this population. There are a few small studies. But if you think about it, uh, DBT is really built to treat sort of ingrained, reinforced patterns of emotional, cognitive, and behavioral self-regulation problems. And this population experiences those. And it's a comprehensive, multimodal treatment. And this population really needs that. So at first blush, um, it's, a, it's a great fit. I actually, I'll disclose also that I fell in love with DBT in 1997. I was working at um, a residential school, half boys, half girls, that, had, that were duly diagnosed uh, with intellectual disabilities and mental health issues, and it was a fiasco there. It was a, you know, it was, it was a very challenging environment. I had no idea what I was doing straight out of grad school. And Lynn Sanford, you know, the trauma expert, said to me, you ought to go check out this DBT thing. It's for like suicidal women. And I'm thinking, oh, that's a great application for me. That's just going to dovetail perfectly. But I went there and I, I, I kind of, as I was desperate. So I went, I'm like, oh, this is going to be. And Heidi Hurd started talking about the biosocial theory and, and Marsh's, um, you know, it, framework for emotional dysregulation. And it was like the, everything just came clear to me. It was like angels were singing. And I was like, you're talking about the kids that I'm dealing with, with intellectual disabilities. And so it was really a starting point for me. Uh, I then harassed my boss for the next two years and was able to get intensively trained. And um, I remember the moment of like getting my certificate at the DBT training. I don't know if you guys, there's probably several of you that have gone through this, but you like dance at the end and I like actually did a cartwheel. 
and Cindy and, and Charlie were there. I was just so psyched and such a loser, but I was pumped. <laughs> no, seriously, and I'm like, I'm going back to Rhode Island and I'm going to be adherent. Because <laughs> I don't want to make Marsha mad. All right. No, I, Marsha looks like my mother, but that's a whole nother. <laughs> I'm not going there. With this room, I'm not going there. So um, anyway, so I, the good news was that I found that really, let's go to the next little slide. I, I found that, you know, maybe it's a stretch. Maybe I'm just used to dealing with this population. But the fit for individual <laughs> therapy was not a million miles off. I felt like I could definitely make accommodations that were making that work. And it was really an important part of what I saw the, as what was effective about DBT for this group. The skills, on the other hand, was a little bit of a challenge, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so you, you, are, you may not be treating people with intellectual disabilities. And when I say intellectual disabilities, the people that I treat have IQs between about 45 and 70. So we're talking folks that have very, very limited intellectual capacities. Uh, not very, very, but not like the pre, they, everybody's verbal that I deal with, but they definitely have in, very impaired learning capacities. So you probably, you may not be treating that. I know I have bumped into some folks that are treating folks with disabilities. You may not be treating them, and you may also not be using DBT, but I hope as we talk, maybe you can just, you know, find a few helpful hints in this about dealing with people with serious learning vulnerabilities. So the folks that I deal with, definitely reading and writing uh, is a barrier. And um, so instead, we use communication sheets in conjunction with the diary cards. And the diary cards are really secondary. Um, it's very important when we do the behavior analysis part of DBT with this group, especially people that are exhibiting a lot of stage one high-end behaviors, that, um, that we have good information so that we can really do the behavior and solution analysis because folks that have recall problems and memory and executive functioning and sequencing problems, it's really hard to get a clear picture within the time that we have for individual therapy. We use, I, we use a lot of written forms, which is sort of ironic, but we read them to, we sort of, we make sure that uh, we read, it, read things to people. And things like informed consent, we take a lot of time on that because I, the folks with intellectual disabilities that have, you know, been in the system for a long time, it's, they have a, you know, it's their sense of identity and their sense of their um, sort of overcompliance sometimes in the system is really prevalent. And so we take a lot of time to make sure that they really are interested in doing, engaging in this relationship. So that's a little bit more pronounced. Um, all the DBT strategies we use, um, at by the book, with and we'll talk about the the um, the quick step assessment helps make the adjustments, and that's actually the next thing we're going to talk about. But the stages, the hierarchies, validation, contingencies. I think what we do a lot more of though is orientation, because folks with disabilities have a hard time with transitions, and so helping orient people to shifts in the treatment, shifts in the conversation, and in the focus, and orienting to what what is going on is a really useful tool. Um, like I said, um, behavior analysis is impacted by people's memory and, and sequencing capacities. It's a slower process. We definitely use a lot more visuals to sort of chart out finding the, doing the chain analysis. Um, treatment itself has a longer time frame. Um, and like I said, we had to change the accessibility to the skills. Folks that have been that have these issues and have trauma issues, have a hard time with novelty, and so, um, and, and um, have a difficulty, like I said, with transitions. And so uh, I think that has to be sort of in the forefront of our mind. Developmental issues, um, actually let me talk about um, behavioral treatment planning. I think that, you know, it, it definitely is a part of the treatment, but it really does have to be negotiated with the person carefully. Just applying, I've talked to certain people that feel like you just intensify behavioral treatment planning, but that's just, you can't use that as a broad brush stroke. It really is a process with getting the person integrated into the process so that they, um, so yeah, they're not just getting acted upon by the environment, that they're actually collaborators in that, and that's an important issue. 
Um, when we're dealing with these folks, sometimes there's a lot of polarization between staff and, and the consumer. And DBT is wonderful because it really creates an egalitarian um, sort of playing field where it's not sort of, I'm smarter than you, you're, you're, you know, you're not. So there's, the, there's not fewer power struggles. And for this population, it's really important to really clearly define this as an egalitarian um, relationship. And that's really, that allows that identity that we've been talking about today just to begin to sort of be mobilized. And that's a big part of what the skill system is about, is sort of engaging that sort of identity. Okay. Behavioral tree and I talked about that. Okay. We also do integration of services, so we do wraparound supports. I have to say it's really challenging sometimes to get teams to function as skills coaches, and we get into a lot of systems work within the agencies, and I think that's sort of one of those things that sounds really easy. Well, we'll just train staff to be skills coaches. Sometimes it's just really difficult, and that's, it's really one of the next things I'd like to master if I possibly could. Okay. All right, the quick step assessment is something that we've developed, or I actually developed, it's, just, it's really just a common sense tool. It's based on um, the work of Sweller with uh, the cognitive load theory, and it just, I had to transfer the idea of what it's like to sit with a person with intellectual disabilities and make the adjustments that, have, that we have to do when we're trying to create an intervention. So the first step is to, to um, assess the cognitive load of the intervention. And we'll talk about that in just one minute. The second step is to evaluate where the person is at in that moment with their level of cognitive regulation. And the third is to make the changes that you need to in the, in the intervention. Let me just go over just a, one quick quote from uh, Sweller about this. Cognitive load theory is, a, is concerned with the learning of complex cognitive tasks in which learners are often overwhelmed by the number of interactive information elements that need to be processed simultaneously before meaningful learning can commence. I just love this next, um, this bit of information that he gives us. So these are the, th these are the elements that increase cognitive load and, and that impacts people's learning capacities and their ability to process information. So when there's simultaneous processing of information or new information or high volume of information or interactivity of information, retrieval of divergent information, rapid shifts without transition from one topic to another, strong emotional responses to information, and strong, remotion, and strong emotional responses to the intervention. So pretty much everything increases cognitive load. So what do we do, what, we, what do we, so step two, so it's just paying attention when you're gonna be doing something, is what I'm doing gonna increase cognitive load? It's really important for us to be proactive and understanding that what we're doing is going to be part of the transaction with this consumer or with this client. And so we really have to be mindful of what we're asking them to do and which things on this is it going to be triggering cognitive dysregulation. Okay, so, what do, so then we start looking for, as we're moving through an intervention, we want to see how somebody's reacting to it. Do we see signs of confusion? Are they becoming unfocused? Is there some sort of avoidant looking behavior? Are they experiencing discomfort or what might look like will willfulness or resistance, right? And some of it, that resistant client, I'm sure sometimes has to do with the fact that we haven't designed things properly and that people are just having a really hard time with what we've decided to talk about and how we're doing it. So here are just some ideas about things you can do in that moment when you start seeing those signs of when people are dysregulated. We can try to simplify the concepts. We can do a task analysis. Sometimes that's a common problem is that we don't see like how many steps are in something and like they get jammed up on one of the early steps and we're, we kind of in our minds are oversimplifying how to get there. We don't see that there are some intermediate um, you know, processes that are going on that they're not, they're not able to transition through. Um, worked examples, kind of give people the right answers. Don't make them have to go and search sometimes. So showing them how to do it correctly through like modeling is, is helpful. Shaping, obviously, of interventions. Validating the person's experience. Positive reinforcement. 
and then contingency management, just sort of letting people know sort of um, how they're doing. Okay, great. All right. So uh, here's the cover of the book, and uh, it's called the Skill System o Instructor's Guide. And um, in this, it's pr I present um, the skill system, and it's got like all the all the curriculum materials you'd ever need, and you can you can get it through Amazon for like 29 bucks. It's it's a really inexpensive. Um, set of very comprehensive tools for people. Um, and so let's just take a second to look at our data, our little pilot data that Milton Brown did with me, thank God, because he's a fantastic statistician. Um, we had an N of 40 of folks with intellectual disabilities that were at ICS for at least one year. Uh, they all demonstrated challenging behaviors. Um, their IQs were the mean was about a 59 something. And then, um, and the IQ, like I said, that was the IQ. In the ages, uh, the mean was 36. Everybody also had a mix of mental health dis um, diagnoses, too. I forgot to put that in here. But notice there is no control group, so it's not an experimental design. We broke it down into three levels of risk. Red flag <coughs> behavior is like low risk, sort of non-compliant behavior. Dangerous situations is like threatening behavior. And then lapse behaviors are sort of really sort of violent, aggressive, or problematic behaviors that break the law. Uh, we looked at demographic information. We took behavioral outcomes over a four-year period. There's a lot of data in the disability system because people, um, when they have a behavioral treatment plan, you have to you do a lot of tracking of behavior, so we're really fortunate that way. That is one of the strengths of the study, and it was, long, it was longitudinal, and it was four years. And we used a repeated measures design and some hierarchical linear modeling for um, some of the associations. We did see, uh, if you can see that, well, the data looks pretty good. I mean, so, um, what have they got for numbers? Um, so the red flag behaviors came down really quickly in the first year with this combo individual DBT and skills training, down to a .001 uh, significance of change. And in the dangerous situations, it was a .003 level of significance. And then in lapse behaviors, so you can see, and it's really kind of interesting here, in dangerous situations, it kind of goes up, although not significantly, but it goes up a little bit as the lapses go down. Isn't that kind of cool? That's kind of saying to me, all right, they're threatening and they're not doing. So that's just kind of cool. Um, but I love this sort of trajectory there on the lapse behavior where it comes down, then it kind of, it doesn't significantly go up, but it visually goes up. And I kind of see that as that sort of adolescent, I'm all that in a bag of chips, I'm trying to get my, you know, I'm, I'm kind of working with my team. It, like it's, and it goes down further eventually. And that's at the four year mark. And so I think that's sort of, it's one of the few articles that's in press right now with um, the Journal of Mental Health Research and, uh, intellect and Intellectual Disabilities. Um, but it really does sort of for the first time talk about the fact that l the treatment needs to be longer for this group. Okay. So the design of the skill system, we'll talk a little bit about it. And this may be relevant for what we've already talked about today a little bit. Um, so the skill system is built as a series of skills that are overlearned to help span the duration of an, an emotion. You know, Marcia talks about sort of a slow return to baseline on an emotion. And a lot of times if folks are just using you know, like a single, a single skill application, what we're looking for is really spanning the entire experience. And we talked today also about the ability to be in the present moment. You know, when someone doesn't have any regulatory capacities, and an emotion can be a very hot, hot, difficult thing. And so um, it, we really are working to increase self-awareness in the moment and being able to be in the present as it is. It makes me think of, you know, I, um, I think about my clients that what it's kind of like is, you know one of those movies where the guy's running through the jungle and he's got the machete and the bad guys are chasing him and he's going, and, the, and he and the girl are there and they get up to the, the chasm like that and they stop and it's like, oh my God, they almost fall over and they look and they look up and what do they see? They see a bridge. But that ain't a good bridge, is it? It's never a good bridge. It's like a vine and a piece of metal and like one piece of wood and they're like, holy, what are we gonna do? So, um, so that's kind of what I notice with my clients is that they're, they're running and 
they stop and they just don't have the skill. And this sort of is so them stepping through an emotion where they have to stop and say, they just don't have the skill to get across it, so we stop. Um, and so what I'm hoping, uh, in theory, uh, the skill system really is about them placing boards in that bridge, sort of as many as necessary to span across that entire experience. Um, and and being, having the capacity to do that, to be able to assemble their own skilled chains, um, helps them manage um, novel experiences more effectively. So the, um, the skill system is also, as far as cognitive aspects, it's designed to, to facilitate recognition and recall. Another silly story, I guess I have a lot of those, um, is I went fishing once with my dad. It was a big day. And he usually dragged me out fishing, like long boat rides. We never caught anything. He was, he was having a blast. It was torture. But this one day, he took me out, and he's like, we're going to go mackerel fishing. I was like, I don't care. All right, so, but what was cool about it is on the hook, they were, you had the line, and there were six little hooks. And what you did was you put it in, and you caught six fish at one time. So I'm like, why do we do the other stuff? <laughs> why? What's wrong with mackerel? I didn't eat any of it anyway. But obviously, it's oily. Anyway, but um, <laughs> I know as a boat was full of these beautiful fish. But anyway, so what's that got to do with the skill system? But it's basically the idea, the design of it is that the skill system is built like that, that line of hooks, that once they start it, because it's all connected with the skills, that you can start the process and it all comes out because it's, because folks learn it as a system. And so, um, okay, so the other thing is it's structured as well as flexible. Um, and that's really critical for managing humanity. I think in the disabilities field, it's really common for things to get oversimplified and kind of dumbed down. I hate that word, but it's kind of used. And they'll you know, say, well, we got a board game to fix that. You know, and we're not looking, and sometimes there's also this misnomer that we're looking at, at squashing or repressing emotion, getting people just to be compliant, and that that's what teams are sometimes seeming to look for. That's not what the skills system is built for. It's really to help people experience a full range of emotion, just like physical therapy, getting a full range of motion, of like physical motion. This is about getting the full capacity to be, experience joy and stress and love and intimacy and making money and you know doing all the things that sort of create um, satisfaction for people. It's important that people with disabilities have access to that as well. And that, that turbulence that is life is important to have a system that they can actually navigate that through that with. And you know, I think from all the reactions that people have from their you know, past experience before therapy, um, you know, there's a lot of ingrained sort of maladaptive chains of behavior and ingrained patterns. And so what we want to do is create a system where the chains of the adaptive capacities and adaptive skills get really more reinforced. Um, it actually also by having this prosthetic and system in place, and um, it really allows people also to, to engage in contextual learning because it functions almost like a prosthetic or a template for them. And so when they go into context, which are very, very complicated when you're a person with intellectual disabilities, this, the situations that they live in are really complex. They, the day programs have a lot of people that have a lot of issues and a lot of behavior problems and you're dealing with staffing. It's, it's not an easy life in a lot of ways. And so being able to learn and utilize something in that when they're at a very high, high level of cognitive dysregulation it's important that, um, that it's overlearned um, so that they can then recall it in those high stress situations. Okay, so we're hoping that folks uh, get some behavioral control by being able to make effective transitions and like I said, constructing those chains. And it's really helping, you know, we talk about navigating and difficulty <coughs> navigating with the earlier talks today. This really functions almost like a map for people. It, you know, it ha helps them manage the variables, their internal and external variables in an organized, kind of flexible way so that they can, they can sort of navigate um, both of those internal and external environments more effectively and more consistently. 
The other thing is the developmental piece. And I think Bessel was talking about, it's really cool. He, he said, experience the self the way you are. And that really is sort of how the skill system is built. Because the skill system doesn't mobilize a lot of like, this is right, this is wrong, the pros and cons, the cognitive ex sort of um, explicit thinking. It really tries to get at wisdom. It tries to get to that inner voice, that inner capacity that all these people have. And it's really mobilizing their strength, not their weakness. And it has a double bang for the buck because not <coughs> only is it a strength, but it's also a really important part of identity development to really get that sort of sense of self um, you know, activated in their life context. It also creates, um, you know, our, in these systems, it creates a, a common language between people in group, as well as um, in, their, in their group homes, and, and that can also expand learning. Um, it also gives people environmental tools to use in their environments. We are talking about manipulation before. It's like, no, I want, I'm gonna train my guys to be manipulative. They're gonna be very, very manipulative. They're gonna be getting what they need from people, and that's really what are, we really work on, being effective and trying to, to manage these very complicated, expansive teams of people that are supporting them. And so the skill system's an important part of that. Okay, now enough of talking about that. Now you have to start remembering stuff. All right, there are, how many skills in the skill system? Nine, very good skills masters, I love it. All right, you guys are good, all right. Um, okay, so adapting back to that adapting question. Okay, so I came back to Rhode Island after getting trained, was really gonna do it. Well, um, the first sign was when the bell went flying out the window. That, I said, that's not a great sign, and I'm a pretty good teacher, and it wasn't working. And then I just had this sense that I was actually, in fact, torturing my clients. And I had another, you know, I was. I was like, I was, but I was adherent. Um, so it was a real dialectic there. And so um, I just kept, I had little flashbacks, too, of like when I was a kid. Um, I had my sister seven years older, and she was wicked cool. And she didn't like me very much, which was kind of made me sad. But, um, but every once in a while, it was like twice a year, she'd say to me, she'd go, so Julie, you want to play cards? And I'm like, what, what do I think? Yeah. Oh my god. So inside, I'm like, oh my god, my sister wants to play cards. She thinks I'm so cool. We're going to be bonding. I love this. And she's like, yeah, 52 pickup. Like every time, and I get that look every time, like you're like in a movie. So it's like I look down. And it's like everywhere. And that's kind of what, I mean, I love, I love DBT as much as it can be loved. But unfortunately, the way that the skills curriculum is put together, it's not really user friendly telling people sort of what skills to use when. And so I kept, I would, I sort of think about 52 pickup because that's what my clients, they just didn't have the capacity to draw things together in these contexts where they're totally dysregulated and they have a 45 IQ to boot. So, um, and sometimes the mnemonics are a little bit challenging. Like my favorite is L in please. What's L for please? You know, treat physical illness with L. All right. I don't know, I'm sure it's very good. No. <laughs> It's just not hugely intuitive, but it's just, it's just me. Okay, now, all right, let's go. No, it's, it sounds like Marsha bashing, but it is not Marsha bashing. Okay, you can't barely read this, and I managed to mess up your handout a little bit, so you have a different version. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. But everything that's on this, you have in your whole little packet. So try not to, to get too upset about that. But let's just go through these. So, um, so these are the nine skills, and you'll notice that, that we try to get the language to reflect the action that we're looking for the person to do. So let's think about what's implicitly built in to the concept of clear picture. And it's number one for a reason, it's first. So what do you think clear picture? Well, we're gonna say it's probably clarity, right? The sense that the first step is to be aware of your internal and external experience in the moment. And it just doesn't end there. You know, it's, it's, that's just the, the first element. 
So there are six parts of it. I'll just read through them quickly. This is what you don't have, but it is later, okay? So the first thing is, and these are not in any particular order, but we basically learn them in order. But the six conce concepts are take a breath, notice your surroundings, label, I mean, do a body check, label and rate emotion, notice your thoughts, and notice your urges, okay? The point is really to get a 360 degree view sort of, of outside and inside, and we're not talking about this like ohm meditation thing. We're talking about a quick snapshot that helps you understand where you're at, where everybody else is at. My clients talk about it taking about between two and three seconds usually to get a clear picture, and they're amazingly good at it. The next one is on-track thinking. Let's think about what's implied there. I'm very sensitive to the term on-track. I hear it everywhere, um, which is a great thing. That's the point, right? We want to be mobilizing the common knowledge that people have that are, that are intuitive. And so on-track implies a goal, potentially, and the idea of thinking and being on track is thinking that's gonna be on track to your goal. Now within that, there's a few steps and we'll talk about that, but I just wanna prime your memories a little bit, get it in there that first time. The idea is to sort of reflect and then check. Um, remember we had a clear picture, the last step was notice the urge up there. The transition point to on track thinking is to check the urge. And that checking process, it's thumbs up for an urge that's gonna help you get to your goal and thumbs down for urges that are not gonna get you to your goal. And this is where this wise mind concept or inner wisdom or just what you think is right it, in your gut, really. It should be down here in your gut, I suppose. But I have it near my heart usually when I do it with my clients. And that's sort of, you know, and, and these guys are really sensitive to what we want them to do because of some of the issues around supports. And so the idea of really getting people to sort of center down to what it is really that they want is, an, is, is a very important uh, process. And it's hard because the folks that are supporting these people are pretty traumatized too. And so they tend to kind of rush. And unfortunately, that's not overly useful and then starts power struggle. Um, and so really that idea of taking time to really make this self-evaluation of whether this action is going to be helpful or not helpful. The next concept of it is turn it. And that's sort of turning it to on-track thinking, sort of you know, working with sort of off-track, not helpful thoughts, and turning it to on-track thoughts. <coughs> okay, so let's look at on-track action. <coughs> What's implied there, the same thing. We have, okay, so we have on-track thinking, that's thinking about doing what's on-track. And then the, the next key part is on-track action, which is taking it not, you know, talk's pretty cheap. We've got to be moving it into action. When I had James Gross, the editor of the Emotion Regulation Handbook, look at this material, he was terrifically helpful, but he was really stressing the idea of this, this triangle of clear picture, on-track thinking, and on-track action, really being the core concepts that are very, very important. Okay, I'll go kind of quickly through these. Um, so to safety plan, pretty obvious what that's about, right? That's looking at how to manage your own sort of situation in a safe way. We'll go into more detail about that. The next one is new me activities. That's sort of all the things you do during the day and we'll break down different types of activities and the different functions that each one can fit. I mean, and that gets into that cognitive regulation, emotion regulation, sort of about what you do has a different impact on your body and on your emotions. Um, and then problem solving, that's obvious. I'm expressing myself, that's fairly obvious. And something called getting it right is actually the, um, the equivalent of Dear Man in, um, in DBT, and this is how people get what they want. And this is a very important skill for this population because they have so many people to manage and getting things, and they have very few resources, and so they really have to leverage their capacities um, very, very well and effectively um, to get what they need. And the last one is relationship care. We'll talk about that too, okay? All right, now we've talked a little bit about the skills and, um, but now, okay, so we got skills, but the whole point was to tie them all together, right? So we don't, we, we've got to talk about the different, so there are three what we'd call s system tools, little guidelines or rules almost for putting them together and, and these go along with the nine skills that they learn. Um, and so the first one here is called the feelings rating scale. And we'll go to that in a second. 
It's basically a zero to five scale that we use to rate emotion. Um, hang on, let's just go to, and the second one is categories of skills. The skills are broken down into two categories. One is calm, is, one is all the time skills, and the other one is calm only skills. And then the last one is the recipe for skills. So let's just go through those. So this is our feelings rating scale, and it's really not a feelings rating scale, but I couldn't call it emotional cognitive behavioral rating scale, because that would have really been like, that would have been not, not really a good term. And so we use the feelings rating scale. Um, and basically, it's how folks rate emotions. And you remember when we looked at clear picture a few minutes ago when it said label and rate emotions in getting a clear picture? This is that scale, zero to five, that folks use. Now, basically, a zero up to three is the range where people are basically cognitively regulated. Obviously, three is a stronger emotion than a one. But basically, in that zone, people are able to be effective in relationships. They're able to have what we would say a two-way street relationship where they're listening and they're talking and they're still being able to be effective. Once they cross over from the three into the four zone, that's when the strong, it's a stronger emotion, the cognitive dysregulation is kicking in more as well as the behavioral dysregulation as well. Then the, the transition, and in there, they're really only able to do one-way street relationships where either they're expressing and they're not hearing, you know, or, or vice versa. And then a five, there's a difference between four and five because a five is when someone is out of control, overwhelmed to the point where they're hurting self, other, or property. Okay. Okay. Ah, sorry about that. Okay, now here's, here's our, um, now the feelings rating scale is very important because it helps us understand what skills that you can use in the moment. And I love what was it, um, Gabriella, that said, strike while the iron is cold uh, this morning. Oh, that was great. This is a lot about what this concept is about. It's really about doing certain skills. See, the first five skills, clear picture, on track thinking, on track action, safety plans, and new me activities, are skills that are really done independently, sort of with the, independently, the person with themselves. And you can use those from a zero to five emotion. And so really, if the person is over a three, i.e. really upset, these are the skills that they focus on first. And, and the second set, which are called calm only skills, which is problem solving, expressing myself, getting it right in relationship care, you only use zero to three when you're able to be interactive. These skills are obviously more complex. They involve other people. They involve people saying that word no or maybe, which is really difficult. It involves people having opinions of their own. Um, and it, it, that you need to be very strategic to be able to use these skills. So it's really important that people are cognitively regulated emotionally and behaviorally regulated as well. I would have to say that about 99%, I have no data to support that, a lot. Of, of behavioral problems that, that my folks have are when they're using their calm only skills when they're over three. They're off, very often, like they'll come in, we'll do a behavior analysis, and they have given somebody a piece of their mind. Well, that's expressing myself. Or they've run away. Well, that's kind of like problem solving. Um, and so, you know, they end up sort of trying to get stuff and they're screaming at people. And so it's getting it wrong instead of getting it right. Um, so those are the kind of things that, so what I like about it is that when you are doing behavior and solution analysis, you're really looking at um, that when people, um, you know, have target behaviors during the week, it's often a skill breakdown, that it's like that they just chose the wrong skills that weren't as effective in that moment. And in that way, sort of depersonalizes it a little bit. It's really like, oh, duh, I should have done that. You know, and the idea isn't, um, you know, because when they're trying to do, say, problem solving or use a calm only skill, those skills are really, really important for this population because, um, you know, they've got to be able to, to be activated and, and manage themselves in their environment. So it's not that we don't want them, I don't want them doing problem solving. It's just what you want to do is do the other skills first until your level of escalation comes down a little bit 
and you're able to step back and then engage in the, in the, in the um, skill when you're gonna be effective at it. And so it really builds in some delay at that point. It doesn't, it doesn't mean not do it. Okay, and the last one, we, so we've got uh, our feeling, so we've got the first two tools are your feelings rating scale, zero to five. We've got our categories of skills, and now we've got our recipe for skills. Now this says that you basically, for every level of emotion, you add a skill, or if every level of emotion, including zero, you use a skill. So a couple of things, so at zero, we need to be using one skill, and I bet you can figure out that it's probably a clear picture that we need to be doing all the time. And then, um, and then at a five, you need six skills, and so what we talk about is stringing together two NUMI activities, because you notice that the um, categories set, there are only five skills in the first category, so if you're at a very high level, we're saying you need to double up on one of those in the first category. <coughs> Okay, so this is kind of what it looks like. This is one of those little chains and there's no particular, this is just a visual on it. So the dotted line represents a more dysregulated response of you know, a very sharp, quick, um, this is like for a level, a very high level stressor where it goes up and then you see that slow return to baseline up top on the jiggy jag and then sort of that exacerbation sometimes when they start coming down and go back up with what you might think would be a relatively small stressor and so the alternative is to become aware of the, um, the emotions sort of early in the experience, as early as possible in the experience. And you can see the pictures here represent clear picture, on track thinking, on track action. In this situation, the person used a safety plan and a NUMI activity. And the NUMI activities they chose were video games and listening to music. And the point is really to kind of bend the top of that emotion a little bit, you know, to help them tolerate the distress without bumping out. And then once you sort of get regular, then you're doing that, when your emotion changes again, or when a situation or your, your levels change, you start back again with clear picture and on track thinking and on track action. And so really it's like this revolving skill use throughout the day. When people first start in group, it's kind of interesting because I'll, I'll say something like, so how, who used clear picture? How many times did you use clear picture this week? And sort of some people, the rookies will say, oh, I used it twice. And the rest of them will look at me like, Julie, how can I count how many times I get clear picture? I did it like thousands of times this week. And this one really, I can, you know, it's like, all right, all right, all right I'm just trying to trick you. Um, and so that's really true is that they're using it all the time and it really gets integrated into their experience. Okay. All right, so we have a, okay. So let's, so that's sort of the overview. Now let's take a couple of minutes and start looking at each one of the skills. Um, I can't guarantee I'm gonna get all through these because I'm just, horrible time manager, but if we don't get all the way through, I'm really sorry. Um, okay, so here are the six clear picture do's, and um, I know it starts with a breath, but it's never really the first one, because um, usually it's some other event, whether it's something in the environment, so you're getting aware of your surroundings first, maybe it's a feeling that, that sort of uh, triggers the need to use skills, it might be a thought that pops in, it might be an urge, but what I try to help the folks talk about is that it's important to then follow that with the breath if possible. So, so, you, so it would be maybe a feeling, then going to the breath, notice the thoughts. So we're looking at really trying to expand awareness through the sort of structured way of the, of the current moment. Okay, one of the things too is the breath is so critical. Um, and it's, you know, we talked about the macro fishing. It really is that trigger, that cue that starts the whole process. Physiologically, it already, it also sort of starts the process of relaxation, or at least it's really about focus. It's not necessarily relaxation. It's actually focusing attention and emotional deployment on the breath, kind of moving uh, into the belly area if possible, or wherever you're, you're focusing attention, whether it's on the, the nose or the chest or the belly, but it's that attentional deployment to start bringing awareness to their internal experience. The other cool thing is that by doing the breath, it really does trigger that sort of sense of centeredness and that sense of internal sort of wisdom and capacity <laughs> and that sense of sort of connection, that touchy-feely connection to yourself concept. And it's really nice that, so, so it's really a concrete activity that they can do that starts this important process. 
Okay. So if somebody says to me, they'll come up to me and they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm really, I'm really mad. I just want to punch him in the face. My comment is going to be, good, clear picture. That's very good. You know, I'm happy with that. That's really actually a really excellent, clear picture. I mean, they haven't done it yet, you know, but they're, they're telling me what's going on. And so, um, and I think sometimes if somebody were to walk up to somebody and say that, it'd be, don't do that. You know, so that's sort of one of the differences with clear picture. It's about observing and describing what's there and expanding that capacity. Another thing is like the feelings rating scale that clients will say to me, I'm at a, I'm at a 10. It's like, all right, so that's pretty, that seems like you're pretty upset. I said, are you hurting yourself other property? Well, no. I said, well, then what are you at? Well, I'm a four. Okay, right there. Right there is a nice little de-escalation. That's a really simple intervention. They're like kind of mad they're at a four. <laughs> all right, all right. That's true. I mean, that's what it looks like. I'm sorry. You know, it seems really true. And it's, like, it's not to invalidate because it feels like a 10. It really does feel like a 10. And it's kind of this that reframing that, well, actually, I'm enduring this. And I'm not beating you up and hurting myself. And I am actually sustaining this at a four. And to be honest with you, they're probably technically at a three at that point because they're able to have a reciprocal conversation where they're listening and I'm talking and they're probably feeling miserable, but at a three. Okay. All right, so we talked a little bit about um, the feelings rating there and getting a sense of, you know, part of as they go through. I didn't really talk about it too much, but so part of this is to, part of clear picture when they do do the breath, Let's make sure there are three components of clear picture that are really important in your coaching. I mean, it's all important, but if you had to do a quick and dirty on it, you'd want to make sure that, you, that you, we, we coach the breath, and we want to make sure we get the feelings rating. Why do you think that's important? Why do we need to get a feelings rating when we're coaching this? Good answer. It tells us what? What? Category, what category to use, remember? So it's really important. That, so if I know that I'm at a level two, you can look at your handout and cheat, that's really fine. It's a worked example. So if I'm at a level two, what skills can I use? All of them, very good. I can use both categories. I can talk about context, I can talk about people, I can talk about any, I can do problem solving because I'm at a level two. Well, I, it tells me something else, too. I'm at a level two. I can use all my skills, which is really, really important information. At the same time, it tells me how many I have to use, right, because of my recipe. I need to be using at least three skills. Okay, and that's part of that understanding that it's the idea of sort of a responsibility to multiple steps. And, that's, and just having people understand that it's not like, all right, I did one skill. Now I can put my feet up and not do anything else today. Um, it started, you know, the recipe kind of started a long, obviously a long time ago, but um, I remember clients coming to me and say, Julie, I took a breath. <laughs> and I was like, all right, guys, but it's like, I didn't want to get into the math, but it's like one-sixth of one skill, right? So it's just not enough. Okay. Okay, great. So here's our transition. So we have our transition. We notice the urge. We're going to be checking it. So here we go, we went over that a little bit with checking it using the thumbs up, thumbs down, and turning it. And um, okay, kind of sort of it's really important too, like with the clients that we're dealing with, this sort of sense of turning it, it's almost like this gets really rusty. And it is it's hard to turn those thoughts and to be on track sometimes because they sort of have a lot of off-track thoughts and a lot of self-devaluing thoughts. And so these are hard to mobilize sometimes, but when they, when they first start, what I notice is that it's mostly about sort of consequences. <coughs> like, um, if I do this, bad things will happen. I'll get on restriction or I won't be able to go on a trip or something like that. And what evolves later is more like, well, you know, if I do that, it doesn't help me get to my goals. Sort of, they become a little more conceptual. Like, that's really not who I want to be. But when we first start out, I have to say, the, the, the turn it kind of thoughts are generally about bad stuff happening. But you notice, you know, as hard as it is to turn sometimes, it's like got a really, it's like, like very slippery on the downside. And so these old behaviors, old thoughts come back really quickly. And so we have to do a lot of turn it 
just that they have a lot of um, ingrained sort of thoughts. Okay. The last part of on-track thinking is about making a plan. That's sort of thinking through the options that they've got. And so in that, they're going to be thinking about, all right, what, ac what skills can I access? And you know, do I how many do I need to use? Although I think probably that the recipe is a better retrospective tool when you're doing solution and behavior analysis. I'm not sure, because most of the skills masters that, I tr that we have they understand that, that that recipe thing is really just a, the first step. It's really about using a lot of skills. You use way more than the recipe. They use these long, long chains and not just two or three because that's just not going to be as effective as when you really pile up the skills in a certain situation. And so they're outskilling a situation and really slaying it. So that's, they get pretty excited about really cranking on that. And then they decide sort of which, you know, so in high risk situations, if they've got some danger. They know the safety plan, NUMI activity is an important thing. You know, if they're having some distress about their plan or something like, or rules, things like that, they're going to be thinking problem solving, but they're so PO'd about the rules that probably what's going to happen is they'll have to do safety plan, NUMI activities till they're in a good space and then get some help and sort through sort of how to do the problem solving. You know, things like that. That's the thinking is sort of what skill is going to help them get, the, get what they want. And it's really a dialogue. I think that there's a really Im important dialectical process that goes on in group. Skills groups are a blast. They're easy to run, um, at least with folks with intellectual disabilities. Um, I do a transitional age youth group um, of non-disabled people and um, adolescents, and that one's a little trickier, but <laughs> believe it or not. Um, so a group runs really, really well. And when people sort of have the dialogue about what skills to use, and they're all debating it and talking about what skill, and we talk about a context, and what skill was that? Well, was it this or was it that? Was it getting it right? I don't know. I was expressing myself. You sure, Julie? Was that non-track action? Like these dialogues are like very in interesting um, sort of dissections of situations. And they have a ball doing it. And they get very savvy at understanding the concepts and context. OK. So then we transition to on track. So here we are, their sort of on track and off track motif that we talked about. And it's really important about staying on track. But honestly, how much do we stay on track, really, right? We're not on track all that much. So just being realistic about the idea that that slipperiness, I mean, we're all pretty slippery with our goals. And sort of understanding that tenuous relationship that we have, that changing relationship. And one of the speakers talked about that this morning, sort of about being, being realistic about sort of um, our capacities for, for sustainability on goals is important. So really, equally important is the idea of getting back on track sort of once you fall off. And um, so the main concept of an on-track action is really that first action that you take in a situation. So if I feel like I want to throw the clicker at my housemate because he's uh, being incredibly annoying, my on-track action would probably be a safety plan at that point because I'm up at about a level four. And my on-track action would probably be ha taking the clicker that's in my hand and putting it down on the coffee table. OK? So that's sort of just an example of that first thing you do. Because having some on-track thinking isn't isn't the end of it. You need to be actually executing that on-track action. But there are also a few other concepts that are important in this skill. So the idea of switching tracks is helpful, because folks get kind of problem-focused, or they get kind of what you might call stuck or off-track. And so what we talk about is that attentional deployment, or actually behavioral change and activation um, that needs to be shifting in another direction we call switching tracks. Um, the other uh, one cool thing is something called an on-track action plan. And this is really sort of things that people do proactively during the week and during their day to help manage their biology. You know, it's things like balanced sleep, balanced eating, um, you know, engaging in work in balanced ways, doing yoga, or, you know, all those things that you do to sort of keep yourself sort of on track. And um, so when, when disruption does come from in, inside or out, um, they're in a little bit better position um, to manage it. They're less vulnerable physically. Accepting the situation is really hard and, and important to do sort of when you've already done everything. And that's a tricky balance sometimes, just making sure that the 
helping the person understand that they really can do every, that doing everything they can is really important to solve these problems because it's really easy to get disenchanted living in these systems that are so, um, I don't know how to describe it, but for folks not in the disabilities world, it's, it, they're very challenging environments that tend to be pretty entrenched in, in the way that they work. Um, and, and so, except there are times, like, they have to deal with being, waiting. They just wait a lot more than we do. They're like waiting for vans, they got to ride on vans with people they don't even like. They got staff they can't stand. Like, like there's a lot of acceptance that goes on as an intellectually disabled person. And so there are times when you just have to coach on track action and accept. The last one is letting go, um, let it pass and move on. You know, this gets into sort of that time where you're saying, all right, you know, you know, you've spent, you know, we spend quite a lot of time in, in the moment with, an, with an, either a thought or a feeling or an, a situation like that. And it's sort of when you say to yourself, all right, this is actually causing me to increase my emotional arousal versus decrease. And I'm kind of ready to bring that arousal level down. And so it's sort of that, um, you know, it's that attentional deployment again, sort of our situation change to try to um, sort of move into another direction. Okay, oh, here's the on-track action plan. I just love on-track action plans. These are just things in the curriculum, like that it's all like, it's all this like things are in work, all the worksheets, and you can, and then you can copy, copyright, you can copy them, and then you can use them in individual therapy. Like, you know, that, that's kind of a fun activity, just like having people set up their on-track action plans. And um, I like this clip art. Look at that little guy. I know I need to get a life, don't I? But, but that's a cool one, don't you think? I love that little guy. He's got his worries, memories, painful emotions. Look at him. Oh, all right. I love that. God, I just showed that just so you can see how cool it is. Uh, all right, so here we go. All right, so we get the three. So we get our little triangle, which is our clear picture on track thinking, on track action, right? And then the next sort of on track actions that they can take at that point at any level would be safety plan and NUMI activities, which we'll get to. And then if they're, if they're below, if they're um, above a level three, um, they don't have access to these, but if they're below, they can do problem solving, expressing myself, getting it right in relationship care. I'm just kind of visually helping you get a little picture of that. Now, we're gonna watch a little video. These are my clients. All the releases, they love this stuff. It's on my website, so um, I, think, I hope you enjoy it. Now, there he is. Todd, you're in the stage left is the savior. All right, wait, I'm going to try this all on my own. All right, here we go, are you ready? What? Come here. I was so close to. Just do it. Can we turn it up? Can you guys hear? Track thinking, on track action, safety plan, new me activities, problem solving, and just myself getting them ready. Thank you. I used to play all the and died. Yeah. Thank you. 
bit, doesn't fit. And Austin kind of, you kind of get a body feeling of whether it's right or wrong. Like your stomach might hurt or your chest might hurt. Staff. I took a deep breath, breathed, if it's helpful, not helpful. It's wearing, not helpful. So I did this, I breathed, this is my other things. Clear picture, on track thinking, safety plan, say if I'm mad or frustrated on the floor, for example, it'll help me, or your object actually will help me avoid the problem by doing the activities they like. What's my bird feeding, for example, to keep me focused so I can get a calm down on the one or two? I know where, thinking, and learn about safety planning to keep myself safe and the community safe. I before I go, I just just I do safe plans so I can keep myself safe and keep me, keep me stay out of trouble. Now we have to take an on-track action just to do it because I think it's kind of hard to do a little relationship care because sometimes still, sometimes people hold, sometimes I hold a grudge against people, you know. It takes me a while to build my little being, being disappointed and kind of angry and upset. I get angry because I get angry at maybe a minute, three and a half, four, and I have to do a safety plan and go to my room and relax. And I have to um, sort out my analytical thoughts, which is on track thinking. And I have to just accept, make lemonade out of lemons. We'll get there. So we don't have a lot of time, and so what I thought we could do, ah, very good, really quickly, and like, we have like five minutes, I think, five or six minutes, okay, great. Skill number four, we'll, we can talk about the video too after if you want. Um, I, I never get tired of watching, because I, I do all the video editing, I just, I love it, so. Um, 
So safety plan is skill number four. Just amazing. I'm going to give you the zip through really, really quick on these. So it's just they learn how to rate their risk. Unfortunately, folks um, sometimes overrate their risk being too high, and they get really avoidant or they underrate and get in tough situations. So safety plan is really about having a clear sense of what the actual risks are, different levels, that may, engaging thinking, talking, and written safety plans, understanding that there are different things you can do in low-risk situations. It's, it might be best to stay there and really focus on what you're doing instead of just bumping out of it and being avoidant. And so gauging when you should stay and engage and do exposure really to the situation instead of escaping immediately um, is an important thing to know. And, and higher risk than folks you know, move proximity, they move away or leave the area. So that's, and here's like one of the safety plans, for example, that they would do um, like a written safety plan. Everyone's favorite skill, for the most part, is NUMI activities. And these are all the things you do during the day um, that are just the activities day of daily living. Um, we break them down into four, and I'm sure there's more, but that focus NUMI activities, feel good, distracting myself, and having fun. Really important, especially when folks are cognitively and emotionally dysregulated to have um, focus activities to do that help with cognitive regulation. I think one of my favorites is just a very simple, like if we're in therapy and somebody's getting dysregulated, I'll just do a simple card sort with them. And it's basically just shuffling a deck of cards and kind of putting black and red to start with because when they're really ripped off, right, they're really upset. They're kind of slamming and they're putting the wrong color in the wrong thing. And so the piles are going everywhere and sort of slowly as they get through it, and I ask them to kind of tidy up a little bit and, and they focus. And pretty soon you're going to have, they're able to do the black and the black and the red and the red and it's, they're keeping it together. And then once they get through that, we sort, once they're doing that effectively, we go into diamonds and hearts and spades and clubs. And that's a little bit more dif differentiation there that they have to do. And so that's just kind of like a tangible little trick that, uh, that I like. But organizing, cleaning, counting, folding, just having a repertoire of these kind of things, whether it's a video game or solitaire or folding clothes from your laundry. These guys have no money. And so it's, you know, we have to be pretty creative with new me activities that actually are fulfilling and interesting. Um, and they also have a hard time engaging in novel activities. And what you think might be a really reinforcing activity, you're like, why are you not doing this, you're asking yourself. Um, but really, that hesitation and that sort of difficulty with transitions, as well as just, you know, they're, they're, they're just not great sometimes at going out of their comfort zone. And so you have to do a lot of work really reinforcing people to take those on-track actions to do different NUMI activities to expand those capacities. Feel good? These are sort of, um, you know, you know, once the, your body's triggered, trying to Im sort of improve the sensory experience, um, you know, calming yourself, self-soothing. Um, distraction's important. It's really important to know when to distract and when not to. Um, when you've done everything you can and you need to chill out, then distraction's a great thing if there's a lot of things you can be doing um, at that time and you need to be um, doing a safety plan or some other activity. Um, or responsibility, distraction is not the best thing. And so really gauging when to distract and when not to so that you can modulate um, your engagement. Fun, these guys, you know, we, people need to have a lot of fun. We're talking about quality of life. Um, really want people to experience a fulfilling, you know, human, human experience. And so having a lot of different fun activities is good. Am I getting the, oh, I'm at zero. Okay, guys, but that's the all the time skills. And uh, check it out um, if you want to know more about it. Sorry I couldn't get through it all. Thank you. Stay, stay up there, please. We're going to have, uh, que some, we have time for questions. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I, and there may be more things you want to share that can come out in the questions. The questions all are right. starting to roll in. OK, only uh, easy questions. Only None easy questions. None of those hard ones from before. Okay. Um, God, it's first late. easy question is, can your intervention be modified for use with young children uh, with or without um, PDD, uh, pervasive developmental disorder. Yeah. Um, I think there are people doing that. It's, it's really interesting what's happened. Like people, my goal was to make this very accessible. And so I've tried to put a lot of tools for people like on my website really cheap so that people can practice with it and try it. And I think there are a lot of people 
sort of experimenting with different groups. Um, I personally, the only other group I run, which is a transitional age youth group, um, it's basically like taking all the teaching strategies that I put in the book and turning them upside down. So um, I, I think basically the teaching strategies that are in the book, in the curriculum, are need to be tweaked. You can't follow the curriculum for everybody. It's really for this population. Um, and so, but if you alter um, the strategies, I think it might be. You know, I, you know, I, I like collaborating with teams. You know, that have diverse populations. I'd be willing, really, like collaborating with people that want to take it in a little different direction. And that way, you can keep kind of like what I did. You know, you can keep adherence with the model at the same time. Uh, on that, uh, it sounds like there's at least some people that would like to contact you. So you're open to oh, people it's emailing oh, yeah. you. Yeah, cell phone, ready? Write it down. <laughs> Five zero eight. It's all over the website too. No, I'm just not. not. Three one seven. Two one one five. Call me. No, I want to. And if you're using it, you know, call me. I like hearing about it because I like that we, we kind of network. You know, I was like doing a conference a, a couple weeks ago, a while ago, and this guy came up. He's like, I'm from Sweden. I'm using the skill system. I really love it. I was like, sorry, I, didn't, I know I didn't do that accent right, but it was just really cool. So um, I thought it was neat. Has the program been used with behaviorally discontrolled, such as duly diagnosed young adults? Yes, we're doing it now. It makes me feel really old. Um, but yes, call me. Call me on that kind of stuff where we can really just kind of talk about how to tweak it. With, the, with that age group, we really we have to increase the relevant context part of teaching, really getting, they have a very high um, threat. You need to make it relevant for that group. And so it really does change. They're not as sort of readily wanting to, to uh, become regulated. So um, helping motivate them is a key part of it. Um, can it be used with children uh, down to what age, would you say? Oh, goodness. I don't know. I don't uh, how young has it been? Do you know? Um, does it use with children? Uh, I don't know. I know that it's being used at Swansea Wood School in Massachusetts. They go down to age 13. Age 13. Actually, Arcadia Children's Home in Rhode Island was using it, and those, were, those kids were like eight and up. But we're talking about, I don't have any data for that, for sure. How can others, such as caregivers, help use skills? That's a great question. Um, well, it's a little bit challenging to teach folks how to be skills coaches, um, but I would say that the, the tools that are available on the website for like 15 bucks, you can get a, a CD that has the whole summary on it, and you could like stick it in your car radio and listen to it. I think that's a nice tool. The other thing is online on my website, there's competency evaluations that, that are free, and so you can, you can listen to that, and then you can go online and take your quiz. And there's also a skills coaches CD, and there's also a skills coaches exam. And so, you know, for relatively small resources, you can get the information. Um, this one may relate to what you were just saying. It's about uh, dealing with follow through between therapy sessions if there's a substantial intellectual disability. Um, so that uh, things may get lost when they walk out the door. Uh, how do you effectively deal yeah, well, with we just, that? Well, as, as, as standard DBT, we do phone skills coaching. So um, that's a really important part of what, what we do. Um, and, and that really helps with integration and generalization of the skills. And, and like I said, we do really try to teach teams. But it's hard. Staff really are. The people in these environments are not paid very much. And um, they have a few resources around training opportunities. And it's not complicated, but it's a little bit, it's a lot less complicated than DBT. But even this is really hard for a staff member to understand and understand the nuances of coaching. Because it's not just the skills, it's about that relationship. It's about, it's, um, you know, being able to respect their autonomy during the whole intervention. Can the system be used with nonverbal individuals? That's a good question. I think, I think it helps staff um, in that when staff kind of understand sort of some basic concepts, then it can help them regulate themselves, helping them be more effective and not act in dysregulated ways. You know, basically sort of not getting people, to, um, you know, to do complicated things when they're already aroused. Um, that's another thing. There are teams doing that, and, and it's one of those things where I'd like to collaborate and just talk about ways that it could be. Um, would you highlight uh, any skill system 
um, implications, limitations with respect to TBI, and then also uh, dissociation? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I know Ivy Street School in Massachusetts um, is a TBI program, and they're using it. Um, and I haven't been in touch with them since some of the new materials got out, so I think there might be some drift there. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I don't really, I mean, obviously some of the folks I deal with have TBI, and so um, I think that, I think that the structure of it, the infrastructure we talked, you know, Anthony was talking about sort of memory, um, you know, aids, and I think that the whole thing functions like a template or a prosthetic for people, and so it allows them to be more oriented when they're disoriented, and then the contextual learning that goes on in group helps more put more fat on those bones or more muscles on those bones, and so the overlearning of it and then putting it in context for all the people, suddenly the arborization's really going crazy and it really makes it more automated. Um, another one with populations uh, has been used with in correctional institutes. Um, a, a lot of the folks that we deal with are, have sexually dangerous behaviors, so it really was developed to help people that have ingrained patterns of uh, that are that are really sexually problematic. And so I think it's a great application there. It's very heavy on safety planning in some ways, and I have a lot of that kind of material. If anybody is working in corrections, Kokomo, Indiana right now has a SAMHSA grant for an implementation in a hospital that was just re-upped again, and they're looking at shifting it also from the outpatient and hospital setting into the fact into the correction setting because a lot of people are coming from corrections to the mental health center and so they're taking it back to help with the transition out. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, and actually I think uh, uh, Robin McCann, one of the other trainers is using it in, in Colorado as well. Given that individuals with intellectual disabilities are, are three to four times more likely to experience abuse, how do you help clients learn when resistance rather than acceptance is appropriate? Yeah, I think, I think that's all part of clear picture understanding. You know, that's why the system is really important and, under, and the dialogue in skills training. Um, it's not like a class, it's, it's like a group really when you're there. You're talking to people about the nuances of situations and I'm not sure if you could pick it up from the video, but the clients are fairly savvy and have a lot of awareness and I think that those are those conversations where they're able to sort of make that dialectical synthesis um, where they're able to sort of bring together the polarization. And, and I know that, and I don't, this is anecdotal, but you know, people with disabilities are really seen as having black and white thinking. Well, I find that with skills training, and I'm not saying it's a magic thing or anything, but with the, the training process, you can really see people able to see the gray and things, but it's just taking the time and having the venue to do it in, and people that are listening in a way that can hear people and so when they're able to be regulated and they have a cohort that are all having these conversations, it's amazing how sort of much less polarization there is and more synthesis there is. Uh, this may be a follow-up to, to that. Um, how did you get your clients to the place that they understand and accept acceptance? <laughs> Everyone hates acceptance, don't we all? Um, it's a process, you know. I don't say everybody's fantastic at acceptance. I think it's, I think, you know, we probably get beat down to acceptance in some ways, most of us. Um, you know, I think it's that dialogue of sort of knowing what's gonna work and, and understanding through trial and error, sort of, all right, you know, I've done what I can and, and then sort of regrouping. It's not static, none of this is static. You know, it's like, if it doesn't work today, we can reevaluate it. We didn't get to problem solving, but that's about like making plan A, B, and C. You really wanna, you really want to get to sort of your top reach and then sort of the middle and the bottom. You don't want to, we've got to be really flexible and, and shoot for things. So what I would say is try something else in that vicinity. All right, and, there, and then uh, the last ones were compliments on your, on your uh, presentation and also again about contacting you, which I'm going to direct people to uh, your website, which is in the materials. Yeah, definitely. Oh, it's that's... just www.theskillsystem.com. And I'm like the webmaster. So be nice about the site. It's not very fancy. Okay, I'm a social worker. <laughs> I know. And I'm like film editor, you know, it's like I got so many hats and none of it particularly fantastic, but it kind of helps bring it to, you know, when I get calls from Alaska saying, I've got these people, I've got no money. My program has no money and we've got these disabled people in the boonies of 
you know, Ontario, northern Ontario, that, you know, and so it's just, it may, you know, pulls at those social worker heartstrings, and so um, I just want to get it all so they can get it really cheap and easy and free as much as possible. Okay. Thank you very oh, much, you're Julie Brown. Thank you, guys. Um,